my name is Adora Spitok, and I'm thrilled to be able to be speaking to you over video today. Now I want to start with a question. What do you think a group of adults, um, seeing a group of teenagers, maybe some are on their phones, and some are talking, and some are chatting and laughing, what do you think would be the first thought that comes to their mind? Would it be, look at these teenagers, they're probably thinking of wonderful things and helping the world, and they have insightful thoughts on everything that matters in the world. Or would it be something more along the lines of, oh, those hooligans making so much noise and they're on their phones and they're on Twitter and Facebook all hours of the night, they're so naive and impulsive and selfish and spoiled with all this technology and LOL and OMG with a smiley face, that's all they know how to write anymore. Now, if someone said that about you, would you think that they insulted you or praised you? I think the answer would be pretty obvious. Most of us would say, well, if someone called me naive or impulsive, I would be pretty offended. And there's a reason for that. Now, obviously not all adults think that of you, especially not the adults at your school. But unless you're extremely lucky, probably all of us have heard some version of wait until you're older or you need more experience for this at some point in our lives. But with the exception of selfish and spoiled, many of these so-called worst traits may actually be our best assets. Take my own story as a case in point. We often talk about naivete as being a bad thing. During the presidential election in 2008, as many of you know, Barack Obama always called some version of inexperienced naive many times. Well, he was naive and inexperienced enough to win. And as for me, at the age of seven, before Obama's name even came up on the radar, I was naive enough to want to publish a book. Now, about to many, publishing a book really seems to be a very adults-only deal. Just look at any major publisher's list of published authors and ask yourself how many of the people here are under the age of 18. Well, there's not that many and there's a reason for that. Publishing a book is hard. You'll get rejected and even if your book does get published, people might not read it and then add to that all the things that come with being a, a kid, which means that literary agent publishers might not take you seriously because you're a child. And children's publishers will say you don't work with children, which is a little bit ironic. So why would any reasonable seven-year-old decide, I want to get published? Well, I think the keyword there is reasonable because perhaps seven-year-old Adora didn't quite have that same amount of reason as 14-year-old Adora does. I was naive and I didn't see the obstacles that I do now. My logic told me that if there were so many books already published, then surely it couldn't be so hard to get published. And out went the manuscripts, letters, and phone calls, and I think that from my two books, Flying Fingers and Dancing Fingers, you know the ending to this story. But I wasn't done with dreaming big and being naive yet. When I was younger, I loved reading and writing so much that I lived under the assumption that everyone must love reading and writing. In fact, the idea that there could be people who didn't like to read and write never even crossed my mind until I met one of these people who was like, oh, I don't really like reading and writing. I was like, what? You just shattered my world. Okay, I didn't quite say it like that. But naturally, I decided that I would simply go to schools and make other kids like reading and writing. Of course, I was naive enough to think that it was that simple, that I could do that. I didn't start by running surveys and crunching socioeconomic data and reading journal articles and making inferences as countless experts have done. Instead, I just marched off to schools with a bag of stuffed animals and a computer to weave stories with audiences of children who were sometimes taller than I was. Naivete starts to look like a pretty good word. When we hear the phrase acting on impulse, though, we often think of extremely negative things. Scandals, shaky financial markets, unwise decisions. But sometimes an impulse can be a driving force for social change. Five-year-old Phoebe Russell of San Francisco, California, was on a drive with her parents when she saw homeless people by the street. And she asked her parents, why are they so sad? And why are they there? And the parents explained that they were homeless and that they might not have enough food. But look, there's the food bank, and um, that's where they help people who are underprivileged. So Phoebe naturally saw that and thought, hmm, what can I do to help? And so she decided to collect cans from friends, classmates, and relatives to put into a can drive and use can refunds to feed 18,000 meals to the hungry at the San Francisco Food Bank from can refunds alone. Wouldn't you like to have these kinds of impulses to see problems, to see issues that need to be solved and be able to spring into action and do something? Imagine how many problems we could solve and how much better the world could become. How would you like to see millions of trees being planted in your city? Well, millions of trees were planted because of Felix Finkbeiner's big dream, his impulse. 
In 2007, the nine-year-old found a plant for the planet, a student initiative to green the earth by planting trees. And so far, they've already planted over three million trees. So far, kids from over 70 countries have participated. In 2009, he spoke at the UN General Assembly to launch a campaign titled Stop Talking, Start Planting, and their campaign posters feature adults with their mouths covered by cheerful kids to indicate we really need to start acting a bit more on impulse. From Phoebe and Felix's stories, we can learn about the value of seeing a problem and taking immediate action, asking right away, what can I do to help? What are the problems that you see in your community, in your nation, in your world? And what can you do to solve them? The question is, are you naive enough to think that you can? And are you impulsive enough to, thanks Nike, just do it? Luckily, there's finally a tool that many of us are super good at that can possibly enable us to do just that. Many of you probably use social networking of some kind or technology. And I've seen that aside from maybe having weird chats with your friends, you can really do a lot more using online tools. Being good at organizing social networking really came in handy when I organized an independently organized TED event, TEDx Redmond. And we started in April of 2011 with a Facebook message that I sent out calling for committee members to help organize and plan. And from there on, technology was in constant use. We used everything. We used Google Docs for our different subcommittees, PV Works, Wiki Spaces, made a trailer video to post on YouTube and circulate through social networking, tweeted and Facebooked, Skyped and live streamed the event. I think it's accurate to say that TEDx Dragman probably would not have happened in the form that we know it without the internet. But you may be hearing this and thinking, well, not everyone in this room can just go and use Facebook to start a conference. Well, the point is not the scale of the action you take, it's the intention that matters. I want to tell you a story about someone I know. Funnily enough, the two of us didn't get along at all. I thought he was like the most evil child on earth and um, misbehaved all the time. Now, Long story short, I hadn't seen this person for quite a while, but um, a while ago I opened up Facebook and I saw this message that said um, orphanage fundraiser. And as it turned out, this kid whom I had always thought of as the epitome of this behavior, this little individual, was doing a triathlon to raise money for a Southeast Asian orphanage. Now, if that doesn't tell you something about first impressions, but the other thing that I noticed was that he was using Facebook to solicit donations, to raise awareness about the event, and to publish a list of names of people who would donate and thank them. And this is a great example of how accessible taking action using the tools that you already have at your disposal can be. And my older sister Adriana sent out her birthday party invites via Facebook like probably millions of other people, but she sent out something else as well. A note asking for, in place or in addition to a birthday present, for a donation to the world's youngest headmaster, Indian student and teacher Babar Ali, and his school, which serves children in his hometown too poor to attend regular school. So this boy was coming home from his lessons and seeing um, other young people who weren't able to attend school, and he decided, I have to fix that again, impulse and naivete as well, and just set up a school in his backyard to teach these kids right after he came home from school himself. And his school really took off. And so my sister, in her birthday invitations, added this note, and I think it really goes to show how powerful something small tacked on something large uh, can, can really have a bigger impact. Another person, Alec Lors, an environmentalist, spread word about his revolutionary I Matter march not only through his speeches and the movement's website, but also through Facebook and Twitter. So again, the tools that we have at our disposal and really using them to have a larger impact. The thing that these stories have in common is that they're close to home. These are ordinary kids who lead ordinary lives, but it's the actions that we take to help others, large or small, that can make all of us extraordinary. So next time your parents scold you for wasting time online, or you're with a group of friends, and maybe you're on your phones and you see adults kind of rolling their eyes, oh, what are these kids up to? Now, you can say, I'm helping the world, because maybe you're launching a social media campaign to end sexism or fight world hunger, or, you know, as long as you actually start the campaign, whatever you do, you'll be pretty hard to argue with. From this social networking discussion, it would be easy to imagine that young people taking responsibility for their world is a relatively new thing, but it's really not. You can look back to history for role models as much as you look to the present. Children, teens, and 20-somethings have pushed limits since ancient times. 
At 16 years old, Alexander the Great, you might have heard of him, was left in charge of the country while his dad, the Emperor Philip II, was away. That is a pretty sweet house-sitting job, if I may say, country-sitting. And 16-year-olds uh, in the audience, you know, you might think, okay, I'm no Alexander the Great, but seriously, what is your excuse? <laughs> Okay, so admittedly now we know being a dictator is not a good idea. But another Alexander, this one from the United States, also starred early. Alexander Hamilton, a founding father, was writing for the local newspaper at 14, writing political pamphlets at 18, was uh, talked a mob out of attacking the presence of King's College at 19, and by 22 was a lieutenant colonel and aide-de-camp to George Washington. That's not uh, pretty prodigious, I don't know what is. So despite well, these countless examples of amazing young people through time. A lot of thinkers, authorities, and experts have consistently emphasized how much better adults are. But experience and age, or lack of it, shouldn't count against us. We have as much to teach our elders as they have to teach us, maybe just in different areas. The most obvious example, probably some of you have helped your parents or grandparents with technology-related things before. I know from experience how much adults can learn from kids in this area. When my dad wanted to set up a Facebook account, my sister and I showed him how to use it and he became a fan pretty quickly, well maybe too quick because he started liking every photo that we posted, which was a little bad. So my sister um, put him on the family list, which is essentially the Siberian exile Facebook list, am I right? A lot of people have decided that derided social networking for making families fall apart or get more distant from each other not really talking to each other in person, but I found that my sister and I have actually become close to my dad because of being able to share this world of social networking. And because of my dad being online, we're having more conversation about things that we can teach him, whereas it used to be only us asking the questions. Though sure, this is an obvious and everyday way in which adults can learn from us, I want to emphasize that it doesn't stop here. This is just the tangible part, the things we do on our computer screens where we're showing mom and dad. You know, that's just what we see, but the intangible is even more powerful. Our optimism, our audacity to dream, our determination to accomplish. Some of those worst traits that can actually be our best assets, naivete, impulsiveness. As the American author Pearl Buck said, the young do not know enough to be prudent and therefore they attempt the impossible and achieve it generation after generation. We have to follow this quote, we can be imprudent and accomplish amazing things. So next time someone calls you naive with a dismissive wave or frown on their face, say thank you. Maybe they have something to learn from us. And what is it that we can teach our elders? Well, maybe it's that enviable startup attitude that I'm already broke so it can't hurt to start a company outlook. Maybe it's the ease with which we weave social networking into doing social good. Maybe it's the inexperienced, impulsive, and naive can be good words. Let's all take action, not only to redefine ourselves, but also the world we live in. Thank you.